Welcome back to Half the Battle. I'm your host, as always, Daniel Levy, your co-host, Shaq. We're going to be talking UFC 257, Conor McGregor versus Dustin Poirier, and Shaq is going down tomorrow, Saturday, in Yas Island, Abu Dhabi. You got the most exciting lightweight fighter in history, Dustin Poirier, taking on the notorious, the first ever champ champ, Conor McGregor. It's a rematch six years in the making, and I have a feeling that this fight is going to be very, very exciting for as long as it lasts. I don't know about you, Dan, but these are two of the greatest fighters in lightweight history, two guys on the pound-for-pound pound list in the top ten. It doesn't get much better than this, the glamour division, the lightweight division, the king of wars, Dustin Poirier versus the guy that changed the game in terms of the the market bit uh the market bit uh sorry market you know marketing and um and how the pay-per-view game changed when he came in so I'm super excited Dustin Poirier like you said is arguably the most exciting fighter in UFC history the Holloway fight the Eddie Alvarez fight the Gaethje fight the Pettis fight I mean, I mean there's even some that you could go back to the 45 days as well so I'm super excited for 45 legends, 55 legends, and let's see who wins. Man, it, it's so amazing. I mean, it's such a different vibe than the first time they fought. I mean, you remember the animosity the first time. Dustin clearly wasn't himself, and also it was at 145 pounds. The weight cut was drastic, but now these guys are fathers. These guys do a lot of charity work. They're shaking hands. They're hugging. They're exchanging gifts. Like It's a completely different vibe, but make no mistake about it. They're still going to try to knock each other's heads off in the center of the octagon tomorrow in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, there's no there's no need to disrespect each other. Both guys know what both guys are capable of. They've seen what a, the other guy can do. There's no need to there's no need to trash talk when you're a, a guy like Dustin Poirier and McGregor anymore. I mean, it, we know what the deal is. We know that both guys are stars now. Both have done so much in the community, and you know I think McGregor gets a bad rap on a lot of things, but man, he helps out the community a lot. Same thing with Dustin Poirier. Both guys got great stories, and uh, and it's good to see them, you know, shake hands. And and we've been through this for a while. Um, we know that the, the fire, you know, they still have a, a clash. They they have a disagreement on who's the better guy, but uh, they get to see who uh, who's the better man on Saturday night. Yeah, um, it's actually kind of cool to see the respect between them because I, I know you remember six years ago how intense it was. So now it's awesome. I mean, let's just see who the better man is. And don't get me wrong. I love my shit talk, too, but I like it when it's natural, and it would be kind of forced that these two were bickering like they were six years ago. They're completely different men, so I cannot wait uh, to see what happens. Also, got to let you all know, um, we're going to break this whole card down start to finish, and we will be the only podcast covering the Armin Sarukian versus Matt Frivola fight, uh, which just got announced today. We'll be talking about Ottman here in a second. So before we do that, um, I just got to give a quick shout-out to two Braves legends. Uh, rest in peace, Don Sutton. And rest in peace, Hank Aaron, you know, two guys that truly uh, all-stars, Hall of Famers. They set the bar. Don Sutton with the pitching, Hank Aaron with the home runs. Man, it, true, uh, true tragic losses, man, losing those two, man. 100%. Hank Aaron, in my opinion, you know, Barry Bonds is the home run goat, most home runs. But we know who did it the natural way and who did it the uh, – <laughs> The needle way, if you know what I'm saying. All greats have to come uh, to an end at some point. Hank Aaron, it was his time, an all-time great, especially in Atlanta. You know, we live in Atlanta, so we we know how big he is down here. And Don Sutton, I mean, I listened to this dude on the on the Braves broadcast time for years. You know, as a kid growing up. So rest in peace to those guys. Yeah, man. Um, we'll always honor those two. So, man, it's a it's very emotional time in Atlanta right now. But before we break down this uh, car start to finish, guys, listen up, fellas. 2020 sucked. It's finally the new year, which means new balls with our sponsor, Manscaped. Manscaped is the best in men's below the waist grooming, offering precision engineer tools for your family jewels and helping two million men all over the world get rid of hair on their balls. If you let yourself go in 2020 while in quarantine, Manscaped is here for you to reboot and stay clean and shaved in 2021. And Shaq, I mean, you know firsthand how much 2020 sucked. And now it's time to come out here in 2021, a fresh new start. Be ready for any short notice opportunity, just like Kevin Holland. And Manscaped is here to help with a fresh start in 2021 with their perfect package 3.0 that has 
all the right tools for the job. Come out of quarantine with clean balls thanks to the Lawn Mower 3.0. This waterproof and skin-safe trimmer will reduce nicks to your two best friends. The third-generation trimmer even has a light to give you the glow you need in 2021. It's also time to freshen up down there this year with the Crop Preserver, the anti-chafing ball deodorant, uh, moisturizer. You already put deodorant on your armpit, so why not put it on the on the smelliest part of your body? And for on-the-go freshness, you'll love the Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray. 2020 was awful, so make sure your boys are refreshed and ready for new beginnings in 2021. And a guy with hairy balls is like the year 2020. Do not be that guy. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code BATTLE20 at manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code BATTLE20 at manscaped.com. Shaq, uh, here's to a new year, man, using the code BATTLE20. Happy New Year to your balls, my man. Yeah. That's, you put it very nicely. You want to be like Michael Phelps, you know, clean, clean, clean cut. And when we say clean, uh, you know, all natural, you know, you're only using products that are growing uh, on planet Earth that God put here for me and you. Right. <laughs> so, uh, Shout out to Michael Phelps. Now, Shaq, let's get right down to business, because first up in the flyweight division, we got a showdown between Amir Albazi, who's 13 and one. And Zalgas Zumagulov is 13 and four. Currently, they got this fight to pick them with Zalgas Zumagulov minus 115 and Amir Albazi minus 115. So this is a hell of a fight. Obviously, I would say Zalgas Zumagulov fought the higher level of competition. But one thing we've noticed, Shaq, he gets bullied in a lot of his fights. You think Amir Albazi can kind of bridge the gap of the experience, come out here, and get the biggest win of his career Saturday? It's a good matchup to start the card. You know, I love the flyweight division. Zalgas, he gets pushed back a lot. He's good technically, but not a good aggressor. And that kind of leaves a lot of his fights to be up in the air. When you watch most of his fights on that local scene in Russia, you kind of don't even know who won half the time. Sometimes you're like, did Zalgas even, did he even win that fight? I'm, I'm not even sure. So uh, I, I'm going to go with Amir Albazi. I think he's the more aggressive fighter, the guy that's willing to move forward. I do have doubts that, you know, you know uh, Zalgas' style might frustrate him a little bit. It kind of frustrated Paiva, but we do know Paiva missed weight, was down there by himself. So Zalgas kind of fought uh, the less, the lessest version of Halion Paiva in the UFC. Halion was in Abu Dhabi by himself, had to get cornered by Eliza Zaleski's team. So I, I truly believe that if we had a you know a full, fully prepared Halion Paiva, then that would have probably been a more wider decision. So don't get fooled by that, but I'm going to go with the Amir Albazi by being more aggressive. But it could be close. It's going to be a toss-up. So the first time they were scheduled to fight, I actually bet Amir Albazi at plus 115. Now it's minus 115. It's a completely different price. You're not getting the dog money anymore. And shout out to everyone that did move in on that dog money when it was available. So Amir Albazi has come a long way. If you watch his fight against Shorty Torres, uh, man, he actually was suffering for some of the issues Zagas was suffering from. He gets pushed back. He gets bullied. So Amir Abazi needs to go forward this entire time because Zalgas is the guy that you back him up and he doesn't have an answer for it. And I agree with you. Halle and Paiva, his whole corner had to stay behind in Brazil. He goes there. He didn't have anybody with him. He had to go to Andrade's and Zaleski's people. Missed way. It just was not his night. And he still won the fight. And a lot of these fights that Zagas has been winning, I'm not convinced he's been winning these fights, man. I thought that Tagir won the fight. I thought that you can make an argument for Tyson Nam winning the fight. I think that a lot of these fights, uh, you know, he might have had connections with the promotion. He doesn't have any connections with this promotion. So I'm going with Amir Al-Bazi. I just think he projects to go higher. I think he's the more talented guy. And even though I love my Kazakhs, I've just, I'm more I, I'm more into the Demir Ismagulovs. You know what I mean? I, I don't think Zalgazuma Gulov is that guy. So I'm going Amir Al-Bazi. Now, next up in an 150-pound catchweight, we got Nick the Carney Lentz. He's 30 and 11. And Movsar Ivloyev is 13 and 0. Currently, they got Ivloyev minus 575. The comeback on Nick Lentz is plus 425. I mean, Shaq, Nick Lentz, such a vet of the sport, such a, you know, a guy that's been around for a long time, a staple of the, the lightweight and the featherweight division, nasty guillotine, D1 wrestling background. But that being said, a lot of people, yourself included, are calling Ivloyev a little Khabib. Others say he might be a future world champion. So do you think this is priced uh, accordingly, or do you do you think there's actually some value on the underdog here? Got a lot of respect for Nick Lentz. Been a fan for a while. 
I remember the old Nick Lentz and the new the new uh, Nick Lentz. The new Nick Lentz actually fights. The old Nick Lentz, I know you remember those days when I uh, have to have those talks with him about his lay and pray, but props to him for changing it up. And now he fights really exciting. His fight with Arnold Allen was very was a good one. Will Brooks' performance, the Charles Oliveira series, um, the Scott Holtzman fight was a good fight. So shout out to Nick Lentz. I uh, also hear he's uh, big into the stock market like Eddie. I hear he's uh, uh, one of those traders. So Nick Lentz has something to fall back on. This is just a bad matchup for him, in my opinion. Mazwar Evlo, in my opinion, is one of the top prospects at 145 that's not currently ranked. I think this guy's scrambling ability is top notch in that division. His boxing is improving. To see where his boxing was on the local scene to the fight against uh, – it's the Korean's name, Choi. Then, then you see the improvements in the Barzola fight. And I know a lot of people think that Barzola fight was close. And look, it was a good fight. But you got to look at the step uh, in opponents he, he had took up up until that point. Barzola had, has wins over guys like uh, Mowgli Benitez. And Barzola's a tough, a tough Peruvian. Uh, and then his follow-up fight against Mike Grundy was the best performance of his career, in my opinion, and his biggest test. And I thought he passed that test with flying colors. I, I think that as long as he avoids this guillotine, which he did his last fight, I think he'll land the harder shots on the feet against Nick Lentz and, and just be the more physical fighter. Nick Lentz, I think he's outsized in this fight, even though he's got the history at 155 pounds and Mazvar actually used to be a bantamweight. It's crazy. I just think Mazvar is better than him in every category, so I'm going uh, with him for the win here, probably by 30-26, 30-27. You know, Shaq brought up a, a funny little history uh, fact here about back in 2010 when Nick Lentz fought Andre Winner, he literally pinned him up against the fence for three straight rounds, bored the crowd to sleep to the point where Joe Silva, the matchmaker at the time, had a, you know, had to call Nick Lentz into his office and be like, dude, uh, I don't give a fuck if you're undefeated in the UFC. We ain't having performances like that because, you know, Nick Lentz was undefeated in the UFC at the time. But he went on to have a lot of exciting fights. The first Charles Oliveira fight to this day, one of the best fights I've ever seen. The Evan Dunham fight was badass. And since that point, he's still in the UFC. He's gone on to win a lot of big fights. He beat Will Brooks, beat Gray Maynard, Scotty. He's had a lot of good performances. Um, but when he steps up to face the prospects, I mean... You know, he's become a bit of a gatekeeper these days. Islam Makachev passed the test. David Tamor passed the test. Arnold Allen passed the test. And Saturday night, and he asked Island Abu Dhabi, I suspect that uh, Mosfar Ivloyev is passing the test as well. This kid is relentless. He can fight a bantamweight and 45, super fast, nasty takedowns. But the thing I like most about him, Shaq, is <laughs> it's easy to look good when you're dominating every single fight, right? So what happens when adversity comes your way? This guy goes in there against Mike Grundy, a fellow credentialed wrestler. Mike Grundy gets him in a deep-ass choke, like deep, 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 deep choke, like to the point where none of us would have held it against Ivloev if he went to sleep or if he tapped out. Hey, live to fight another day. He creates the littlest of openings so he can get air. He pushes off the hips. He gets out of the choke, and then he goes on to dominate the fight. I got nothing else to say. This kid, Mosar Ivloev, is the real deal, and I suspect that uh, Saturday night uh, he's going to win this fight. Now, next up in the 205-pound division, we got Khalil Roundtree. He's 8-4, and four, and Marcin Prachnio is 13-5. and five. Currently, they got Khalil minus uh, 350, the comeback on Marcin Prachnio is plus 265. Look, Marcin Prachnio has had three fights in the UFC. He's been knocked out in the first round three times in the UFC. Khalil Roundtree's hit or miss, but the thing is, there's levels to this shit. The guys he's losing to, the Johnny Walkers, the Mikhail Olegzeychuks, the Iwan Kutalabas, these are all top 20 guys at light heavyweight. But when he fights someone he's supposed to beat, he usually beats them every single time. I think Khalil Roundtree's too fast for Marcin Prachnio. Uh, also, since he's been at uh, Thailand, man, his striking's gone up to a different level. You saw that Eric Anders performance. We saw that in Atlanta, UFC 236. Even the last fight against Kutalaba. He was busting up Kutalaba on the feet, but Kutalaba takes him down. The fight was over shortly after. I don't think Marcin Prachnio has the ability to get this to the mat. I think he's too slow. I think he's going to run into something. I got Khalil Roundtree Jr. via first-round knockout, Shaq. I agree 100%. Marcin Prachnio does not belong in this company. I know you saw his Alvi performance in Orlando. Dude was charging forward with his hands completely down, and he got stiffened. And Kalaya took care of business in less than two minutes, I believe, maybe even less than a minute 30. 
Uh, and then Mike Rodriguez, slow Mike Rodriguez. I mean, he, he even took care of business, and he has a very hard time. I mean, Mike Rodriguez can't even finish a fight off when uh, <laughs> he can't even finish Ed Herman, you know what I'm saying? So I'm going to go with uh, Khalil Roundtree to get the job done here. I know Khalil Roundtree has had his hiccups in the past, but like you said, there's levels to this, and Marcin Pacino just simply doesn't belong here. He's too tense. Just look at his face. He, he's got bad energy. Now, next up in the Bantamweight division, we got the Olympic silver medalist, Sarah McMahon. She's 12-5, and five, and she's taking on the ultimate fighter winner, Juliana Pena, who's 9-4. and four. Currently, they got Sarah McMahon minus 130 and Juliana Pena is plus 100. So, Shaq, I mean, we know who the better fighter is here. That's Sarah McMahon. But we also know who the tougher fighter is here, and that's Juliana Pena. So, I, I got to read a quick stat. Um, I, I need to pull this up because I was looking at this last night and I was like, holy shit, that is a very uh, alarming number. You want to take a quick guess what Juliana Pena's takedown defense number is, Shaq? Just at, off the top of your head. Um, not less than 50. <laughs> Way less than 50. 28% takedown defense for Juliana Pena. So, bottom line, Juliana Pena is getting taken down in this fight. That being said... Can she threaten with something off her back, uh, make uh, Sarah McMahon resort to her old way, Shaq? Man, they're going to be surprised on my, on, on my take with this fight. Yeah, uh, uh, so in the past, I know you guys have heard me rag on Sarah. She looked good her last fight against Landsberg. Didn't make any mistakes to the 15 minutes. But I, I figured out why I know Sarah so well. And, and uh, you know, we're actually, me and Sarah are actually birthday twins. You know, uh, we got the same birthday, so I feel like I can read her really well. And, and man, from these uh, from these interviews, she sounds like she's in a good place. I know she's getting up there in age, but she did kind of start the sport late. Juliana kind of looked decent her last fight, but I actually heard Jermaine say that the weight cut in Abu Dhabi was, like, the worst she ever, uh, ever experienced. Like, she said the flight to Abu Dhabi she just didn't like. She said that she'll probably never fight there again. So maybe she fought a, a, a lesser version of Jermaine Durin. I, I honestly thought GDR did kind of look flat in that fight, and she, she choked her out her first submission win. Juliana is tough. We know she brings it. But Sarah McMahon, I, I feel like if mentally she's in a good place and things are going good, I honestly feel like she can, you know, that the, maybe this betting line could even be a little bit wider. I feel like Juliana Pena's best days are behind her. She just got choked out unconscious. Her striking has never been her best attribute. Sarah McMahon does have big power on the feet. She's got big power takedowns. Julia, like you said, Juliana Pena's takedown defense is terrible. So all signs would be leading uh, to, to maybe Sarah McMahon getting this win here and I'm actually going to take her. I know Juliana Pena has a, has a knack for comeback victories in the past, but I've always felt like she's kind of been an overachiever a little bit. Um, and I feel like Sarah McMahon has been an underachiever in a lot of her career, but man, I don't know. I just feel like her, her energy is real good right now. I feel like she's in a good place and I'm taking her to, to dominate this fight, man. I actually think she's going to come out here, pick Juliana Pena up at will and, and ride out this top control. Kellen Vieira was able to to make her quit marrying or no, that was very embarrassing. But I think she took a lot of time off in between, right? Like maybe, uh, you know, quite a bit of time off. And, and it's been a, been a bit of time off in the uh, after the last fight, too. So I'm expecting Sarah McMahon to actually uh, look a little better here. But we'll see. We'll see if she quits. <laughs> so I'm not to excuse the losses to Marion and Kellen, but like, Caitlin's a serious black belt. Marion's a black belt too. Like we can say all we want about Marion's takedown defense, but you know, Mar or Marion, I want to get her name right. You know, Marion submitted Jessica Andrade too, Shaq, right? So these are legit girls with submission games. How many submissions does uh, Juliana Pena have in the UFC? Zero. And she's been submitted in two of her last three. The last one to, I mean, actually two of them to strikers to Valentina and to GDR. Look, two former champions, no shame in that, but it's basically. Pena's path to victory is a comeback, and she's done it before. I'd be worried if she gets on top of McMahon because, you know, McMahon don't like it when someone gets on top of her, and that's where Pena can get kind of mean. But 
the skill gap is huge here. So I'll go with Sarah. Just stay in it for 15 straight minutes. Keep your head on straight, and you win this fight, okay? Because she was winning those other fights, but, I mean, those lapses, man, that's why it's tough. But if she can stay focused, she's going to win this fight. Now, next up in the middleweight division, we got a matchup between Brad Tavares, or as I like to say, Hawaiian Bisbing. He's 17-6. and six. He's taking on Antonio Carlos Jr., who's 10-4. and four. Currently, they got... Brad Tavares minus 120 and Hawaii, excuse me. Currently, they got Brad Tavares minus 120 and Antonio Carlos Jr. is plus 100. So, man, I don't like what I've been seeing from Brad Tavares these last two fights. I understand Izzy Adesanya, he, you know, he's going to go on to be one of the all time greats, but like that was five rounds of a shellacking, the kind of beating you don't come back from. And we've seen these guys that go five rounds with Izzy, they don't come back the same. Look at Kelvin Gastelum, he hasn't been the same since. And Brad Tavares, evidence, his next fight against Edmund Shabazi, and he got blown out the water. With Antonio Carlos Jr., I know he's had his issues in the past, man, especially when he can't get that first-round sub. You know, uh, sometimes he packs it in. But I felt like that last fight, despite being a loss, was a step in the right direction. You know why, Shaq? Because after eating the hard shots of Uriah Hall the first two rounds, Shoeface ends up winning the third round, dominates it, takes his back, and, you know, showed uh, that, hey, I am pretty fucking tough. I can dig deep, and I have matured. And uh, another thing, Brad Tavares historically has great takedown defense, so I don't think that the singles and the doubles are going to be as readily available. But what I do think is that Carlos Jr. can pin him up against the fence, duck under, take the back, and from there control the round. So I'm going Carlos Jr. I'm not sure if it's going to be a sub or a decision, but I, I think he's the fresher guy with more upside at this point. I love Tavares. I love Hawaiian Bisbing, but I think he might kind of be towards you know the other side of the hill. So I'm going Carlos Jr. here, Sha uh, Shaq. Yeah, you know... I just watched tape on this fight recently. Tavares, I do think uh, Shabazian could knock Carlos Jr. out as well, probably. So I'm not. <clears throat> uh, I love you too, Christopher. <laughs> um, but I think uh, I do think Shabazian has a bright future still, and I love how how everyone's writing the kid off after one loss. And I think that he'd probably come out and starch Carlos Jr. Uh, as well, but. There's no denying. I was actually kind of surprised by this line. Even I know y'all love to uh, hear me rag on Carlos Jr. and I, I you know, I have uh, maybe said some things I shouldn't have said about him in the past. But I was surprised at this line, just considering that he's got the, you know, at least dominant skill set. He's a good back taker. He could ride out control for seven minutes, eight minutes, possibly. I respect that about his game. I actually think that he's a a very underrated uh, jujitsu player in MMA. It's just. When he when the going gets tough, he's one of these guys that kind of kind of folds. Brad Tavares, he's in a tough spot because he doesn't really have punching power to scare off Carlos Jr. One thing we've always said about Brad Tavares, just like you said, Hawaiian Bisping. You know what they used to say about Bisping back in the day, which was foolish. But Brad Tavares, how many knockouts does he have in the UFC? Maybe like one, two. Phil Baroni, Baroni and Jocko, Jocko, right? Phil, Phil Baroni and Jocko, right? Oh yeah, Jocko, you're right. But. At, between you and me, Christoph was going through a lot of things at the time. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised by this line, and I'm actually going to agree. I think Carlos Jr. can come out here, hug, his, hug him, hug his back, and, and try to win a decision. At least he did show toughness in, the, in, in those fights against Ian Heinish and Uriah Hall. They were getting to him. They did. He did slip off the back, but at least he didn't quit. He just doesn't like getting hit in his stand-up is, is not very good. But uh, fortunately for him, Brad Tavares ain't known for knocking anything out. And Brad, uh, man, I, I really feel like he made a big mistake before that Adesanya fight. Firstly, even, you remember I was telling you that he shouldn't take that fight. I was like, Brad, they're setting you up. You're on the, well, uh, he was on a, what, three, four, five winning streak at the time, knocked out Kristoff, beat Talis, beat all these guys. And I, and that, that that move might have been detrimental to, to his career, but this fight's gonna come down to who has more heart. Let's see if Brad Tavares can slip, uh, make Carlos Jr. slip off the back or turn into his guard. We'll see. But I'll I'll go with Carlos Jr. I actually think that he should be the slight favorite here. Now, next up in the lightweight division, we got a matchup between Armand Sarukian. He's fifteen and two, and Matt Steamrola Frivola is eight one and one. Currently. I don't see the odds, but I heard that um, Sarukian opened like minus 588. So big comeback on Matt Frivola. 
This fight was made today. Otman and Zaitar. I mean, Shaq, we knew that, you know, he's had a, sketch, a sketchy past and all this stuff, but I, I thought we were kind of past that, man. You know, I, I understand he's got his connections. He's royalty, and you fuck around with an Azaitar brother, you might wake up tied up in the back of a trunk, but I thought, like, can, can we just be 1% professional when it comes time to the UFC bubble, but the guy thinks that he owns the world, the guy thinks he runs everything, and as a result, uh, he's no longer with the company, Shaq, so... You know, it's unfortunate because he's a very exciting knockout artist to watch, and I thought we were in for a treat with him versus Frivola. You know what I mean, man? Very unfortunate, Azatar. I think the plug messed up here. The plan was probably not to get seen. But you know how the Azatar bros get down. We already know this. We've heard some of the allegations against them in the past. I always respected them as fighters. They come to bring it. Unfortunately, it's time for them to move on. But hopefully PFL picks them up. I'll, I'll, I'll be down for Otman, Azatar versus Chris Wade, or Azatar versus uh, Pettis, uh, Azatar versus who else is in that lightweight division? Natan. Natan. I'm, I'm down for all of those. So you know, there, there might be a light at the end of the tunnel for him uh, to still make money. But, yeah, he's got to chill out. But maybe the UFC just isn't the company for him, you know? Yeah, I mean, like, dude, the kind of shit he was doing, like, this is like the kind of shit we used to do back at Music Midtown, you know, cut our wristbands off and give it to our friends so they can walk in for free. And it's like, but we weren't doing it during pandemics. Like, we were doing it to sneak into concerts. Like, he's doing this shit during an isolated bubble during a pandemic when you know you're only allowed to have specific people there. And, man, like, it could have been a lot worse. I know... You have your suspicions about what, uh, you know, that person with the bag came in and had, you know, maybe some Flintstone vitamins. It could have been a lot worse. It could have been something completely different. So, and I, I, I'm actually very disappointed in the Azitar brothers. I, I expected a lot better from them. But did they everybody... cut? Did they? My, my bad. Go ahead. I was asking, did they cut his brother too? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It depends if he was there. If he was involved, I wouldn't be surprised. But. Listen, we all make mistakes. Hopefully he can redeem himself, but this is this is a big one to come back from because he, he fucked up big time. Now, as far as this matchup is concerned, Armand's a huge favorite. Shaq, uh, I think this is a worse matchup for Frivola, actually, because Armand can match the wrestling. The big question we had about Azitar is can he stuff a takedown? But we know damn well Armand Sarukian can not only stuff takedowns, he can get takedowns. So Armand Sarukian has been so damn impressive. What I like most about him is that He's been making improvements every single time. You see the Islam Makacha fight, and that's a great, that's a great show and for a debut. Goes in there against Olivier Aubin Mercy. In my opinion, won 14 minutes of that fight. You know, the only moments Olivier had was with that knee or whatever. Aside from that, I thought Sarukian dominated. And then he took it to a new level against Davi Hamosh. Now, real quick, in the comments, let me know who y'all score that for Vola versus Luis Pena fight for. Because I watched it last night. To this day, it's really hard to score. Second round, 100% for Pena. Third round, 100% for Frivola. First round, the first three minutes go to Frivola. Last two minutes go to Pena. So it really comes down to how you score that first round uh, between Pena and Frivola. That's a tough fight to, to score because it's like Frivola dominates the first three minutes of the first round, but then when he takes him down, he gets caught in this buggy choke, <laughs> which is like some rare shit, the buggy choke. Look it up. And then when they get up to the feet, Pena starts lighting him up. So it's like, did Pena steal that round or, or not? So I'm not sure how to score that fight to this day. I just know second round Pena, third round for Vola. How do you score the first? You guys let me know in the comments. That being said, I think Armin's a better wrestler. I think Armin's a better striker. I think Armin's more durable. I think Armin can go to the top 15. I think Armin might even challenge for a title one day. I got Armin Sarukian to defeat Matt Frivola here uh, in Abu Dhabi, Shaq. Yeah, I got to go with Sarukian. Better, better fighter all across. Frivola, a very tough guy, very exciting do them to the wolves right off the bat, too, so I respect them. I like Frivola in those matchups where where it's even and we get to see who's the more dog. Frivola's a dog. He, he won't quit. You have to put him out unconscious. But, unfortunately, Sarukian just is a, is a class above, so I think he'll uh, win this fight fairly easily. Frivola, um, man, I wish he would have fought Roosevelt. I, I think that was a very good matchup for him right there, so, you know. And next up in the strawweight division, we got a match between Marina Rodriguez. She's 12-1-2, and, and Amanda Hibas is 10-1. and one. Currently, they got Amanda Hibas minus 300. The comeback on Marina Rodriguez is plus 230. Shaq, 
when I die, I want Marina Rodriguez to lower me into my grave so she can let me down one final time. You know what I mean? Because like she's two one and two in the UFC, she could easily be five and zero. Oh, but the one big issue uh, in her game, she doesn't seem to address. You know, it's like <laughs> it's like Otman following the rules is like Marina stuff a takedown. It, it just ain't happening. You know what I mean, man? And you hear the kind of shit she was saying after the Carla fight. So what I wanted to hear was, you know what? I'm going to move to the States. I'm going to work on my wrestling. I'm going to nip this problem in the butt, and it's never going to happen again. That's not what happened, Shaq. You know what happened? She's like, oh, the quarantine. This Marina, the same issue occurred when you fought Randa Marcos in Brazil. What, what quarantine? The quarantine had nothing to do with it. You can't get up from bottom. So why am I supposed to believe it's going to be any different here? And the reason why you know, I'm passionate about this is because I care about Marina. I think Marina, if she could fix up this problem, I think she can be up there in the top five, Shaq. I think she could, she could challenge for a title, but you got to fix that hole. And it doesn't seem like she's taking accountability, responsibility. She, she's being cocky again. And as a result, she's going to get taken down here by the judo black belt, the Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, and she's going to get smashed on the mat. She's not going to get back up, and we're going to be pissed off again. So I get the plus 250 is enticing, especially considering her history with the lines and how high of a regard we hold her in, but if you're not making improvements in that area of the game, it's just it's just hard, man. I mean, Yan Shonen came to the United States, fixed that area of her game. The, these girls that we're high on, they're doing the right things. Can, can Marina just you know play the game this much? So I, I got to go Hebas here, man. She'll get it to the mat and she'll dominate. Yeah, I'm very high on Amanda Rebus. She she impressed me a lot in that debut performance against Whitmire, and I know it's Whitmire and pretty much everyone whips on Whitmire, but I like the way she went about that. The ground and pound was very vicious. And has Amanda Rebus even lost the second of a fight in the UFC? I know a lot of people are saying she hasn't really fought anybody, and I get it, this line is super wide in Marina, but I mean, has this girl even lost a, a half a second of a round in the UFC? That's the type of stuff you want to see to to see if a person really solidifies their spot as the as the top prospect. And I think she has done that. The Mackenzie Dern. I know Mackenzie was coming off the the uh, pregnancy, but I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Mackenzie got beat from bell to bell. Same thing with all the other fights. And Marina Rodriguez. Look, I, I'm still a big fan. I think as far as striking goes, she's right up there with the Yan Chao Nans and the um, the Roses and all those top strikers in the division, Ioannas. But like you said, the wrestling has been an issue since the random Marcos fight. Then we fast forward to the Cynthia Calvillo fight, which is very disappointing because she won the first two rounds in that fight, had Cynthia hurt all over the cage and one takedown, and she had no answer. Then we better uh, again against Carla Esparza, who's got, I know Carla's got the most takedowns in strawweight history. But that fight was actually, I have a, a, a take for that fight, actually. I, I'll tr I'll go ahead and say it. I'm actually thankful that that fight went to a split decision because when you rewatch it again, had Carla Esparza not gone for these stupid leg locks, uh, when Marina had even won a round, <laughs> um, the first round, Carla Esparza comes out, takes her down right away easily, was on top the for the whole round and goes for a leg lock. And then that's when the madness ensued and Marina got uh, got back up to her feet and got some damage up. And Carla Esparza kind of gave her that first round. And I thought the last two rounds were clear. Esparza rounds, Marina ran out of energy trying to stuff those. And it was, and it was a uh, super, it was, it was a bad look for her. Yeah. Rebus has gotten KO'd, stopped by Pollyanna Viana back in the day. But I think her stand-ups come a long way. I feel like she's maneuvering a lot better. And look, the stand-up doesn't have to be a, uh, she doesn't have to beat Marina in the standup. She just needs to keep her honest, play it safe, get that get that uh, clinch on the fence, get her down. And I think she could honestly stop Marina Rodriguez with a uh, not a guillotine, but a rear naked choke, uh, arm triangle, something along those sorts. Yeah. So I, I I like Marina Rodriguez, and I get that that line is enticing, uh, enticing, but it's just too many takedowns, not. Stuff. And Carla Esparza, Daniel, let's just be honest here. That fight was pretty – Carla Esparza had nothing to offer on the feet. Carla Esparza wasn't even throwing punches. And she was just shooting from halfway across the cage. 
maybe Marina would stuff the first the first one, but the second one, it was back to the ground. And it's like, and I've heard Faber say that he tried to get Marina to come. She did come out there to help uh, Corey McKenna, Sarah McMahon, and all these girls. And they wanted her to come back, and she she hasn't come back. So I guess the the COVID uh, kept her in Brazil. So it's unfortunate. Next up in the middleweight division, we got Andrew Sanchez. He's twelve and five, and Mahmoud Muradov is twenty four and six. Currently, they got. Mahmoud Muradov minus 140. The comeback on Andrew Sanchez is plus 110. Do you, are, do you think uh, Andrew's a new man just because he went out there and knocked out a jiu-jitsu guy with no stand-up? <laughs> or do you think that was just kind of, you know, a good matchup? And now we're about to get back to reality here with, I mean, this kid Muradov has got some serious boxing for MMA, some swagger about him, actually represented by Floyd Mayweather, too. Uh, I like what I see. Uh, but that said, Sanchez won the ultimate fighter. He's a vet. Who you got? This is a good matchup because the uh, Sanchez knocking out Thurman didn't really surprise me. Thurman's a young kid, and that, that he was coming off that win against Maluko. So we know Maluko, uh, Marcus Perez, for the for those that don't know his nickname, uh, doesn't doesn't belong in the UFC anymore. So he's probably gonna get cut here. But Sanchez, man, I, I have always, at least for the last year or so, I have uh, thought that he's better than what the public thinks. I, I, I do. I know the Ryan James stunt, the Anthony Smith stunt, the Kevin Casey stunt back in the day. The, the kid has definitely had his fair share of stunts. But I've always thought he's got talent. He can wrestle. From what I understand, he's a jiu-jitsu champion, uh, national champion wrestler. He's, he can bounce around and do the, the taekwondo kicks as well. And his hands are getting better. So I, I honestly think this is the best version of Sanchez. Uh, I think this is the best spot in his career. And I think that finally he is starting to live up to that talent a little bit. Whatever you want to say, Wellington Thurman wasn't all this, this, and that. He was the underdog, you know, and Sanchez was the underdog. So he went out there and, and put him to sleep. Muradov, I think he's super talented, good footwork, good boxing. It, it, this fight is really – we're really going to see what Muradov really has here because – Sanchez, he's been in there with guys like Marvin Vittori as of recently. And, yeah, he did get beat up pretty good in that fight. But I, I thought it was a respectable showing. And when you look at Sanchez, he was a big gasser. We know that what happened in the, the Ryan James fight um, and some of those, the Anthony Smith fight. And we know when the when he fought Barry in Canada, he got gassed again. But he actually, you know, picked himself up. And, and, you know, that was a pivotal moment. Was he going to gas again and get knocked out? Or is he going to, you know, gas again, get his breath back and, and win the round? And he won the round. Then we follow to the Vittori fight. Vittori, in my opinion, is a top five guy, maybe even a little bit higher. That's how high of a regard I have for Marvin Vittori. And, and he hung in there. You know, he didn't get knocked out. It was a respectable performance and then the determined fight. But Murata, look, the I, I do feel like Sanchez is more talented and better than DiCirico and um, and uh, Trevor Smith. So this is going to be a big test. But I, I think Muradov should, you know, stay away from him, keep his footwork up. Uh, it's just a, it's just a matter. We're gonna. I don't. I'm not sure if Murado's been fully tested up to a high level. I know he looks good on on, on film right now, but I, I do have suspicions that you know he hasn't really been put in too much tough spots. I know the third round against D. Chirico did get hairy. He took that fight on short notice. Um, but I know D. Chirico's good, but I kind of think Sanchez is is a little better. And Sanchez actually is a top 30 guy, man. He, uh, this is a gatekeeper. This, he is, you know, gatekeeping uh, for Muradov in this spot. But I, I think Muradov's going to come out with the win. But I wouldn't be shocked if it was a close decision. I think we're going to see a lot of his wrestling defense, his clinch defense, Sanchez, you know, he's going to try to press him on the fence. But Sanchez, we have seen him get rocked in the past. We've seen him knocked out in the past. So we'll see. But I'll go with Murata by, you know, 29-28 type of decision. Just moving around, better footwork, better hands, going to the body here and there. So uh, we'll see. So Sanchez, props to him on that knockout. You know, he's got the Taekwondo background. Good wrestler, won the ultimate fighter. He's paid his dues. And I think he's addressed the cardio issue too, because in that uh, in that Marvin fight, even though he got whooped pillar to post, he didn't gas out in the third round. So it, I'm glad to see him making improvements. But 
That being said, I think Muradov's a serious prospect. He's on a 13-fight win streak. His hands for MMA are serious. His takedown defense is really good, too. He's got a swag about him. And something I really liked in that Trevor Smith fight, I, I get it's Trevor Smith. I know Andrew beat him, too. But I know Shaq remembers in round two when Muradov started finding the body. And then he started attacking the body consistently to a point where, like, when he finds his openings, man, he will tee off on you. And he doesn't rush things. He doesn't force things. You know, if it goes to decision, it goes to decision. If he gets the knockout, he gets the knockout. But he will be up on points. He will stuff the takedowns. And he will light up Andrew Sanchez. The, the boxing difference is big here. So I respect what Sanchez has done, but th this ain't Wellington tournament anymore, man. This ain't a jujitsu guy with no stand up anymore. So I I'm going, uh, I'm going Murdoff here, probably by knockout, but I, but if it goes to the scorecards, I got Murdoff too. Now next up in the flyweight division, we got Jessica Ash. She's 15 and eight, and Joanne Calderwood is 14 and five. Currently, they got Joanne Calderwood minus 120, Jessica Ash plus 100. Shaq. So both ladies very talented. Um, you know, obviously JoJo's got more output than than Jessica, but I feel like every time JoJo gets into a big fight, her head kind of explodes and, and she loses. She pulls stunts in big fights, man. And when I say her head explodes, I know she's so soft spoken. How could she be egotistical? You hear the kind of shit she's been saying in this fight. She's talking about how oh Jessica I walks around like she's a school bully, ruh, ruh, ruh. and then you hear Jessica I talk and she's like. I've never met Joanne Caldwell before in my life. So I think JoJo's doing it again, my man. She does this before every single big fight. And I know Jessica I looked really bad uh, that last fight against Cynthia. But listen, man, she had her gallbladder surgery. She says she's a new woman now. And, and besides all the talk and the hyperbole, let's look at the resumes. Jessica I beat you, Kagan. Jessica I beat Vivian Araujo. Jessica I wins big fights, man. And Joanne Calderwood loses every single big fight she's in. I'm not saying... Joanne can't win this fight because I do think it's going to be like a close split decision type fight could go either way. But one person's the dog and the person that's the dog is the one that I think is better. So I'm going Jessica. I hear via decision. Yeah. So I thought you were going to go the other way. So yeah, <laughs> I think, uh, I think uh, Jessica is getting a bad rap this week. I honestly liked what I heard from her in her interviews. I think Look, I've fallen into that trap. I know you've fallen into that trap of the the hate Jessica I, the hate Jessica I parade. And guys, I'm telling you, the hate Jessica I parade ends up in losing money. I've seen it firsthand several times. Um, I can attest Jessica, to that. <laughs> like, I, I I get it. She is cringe, but when it comes to the fighting, there's nothing that Joanne Carter would necessarily does better. And just look, like you said, she's flaky. Um, in fights where you think it's going to be close, she gets blown out the water. I know what we uh, we have a term, or at least I do, the the Joanne Calderwood yearly stunt, you know, her yearly stunt that she does. So don't be shocked if it uh, comes here on Saturday night. Uh, she, you know, she has a tendency to to start these years off with stunts. The Jennifer Maya, the Jennifer Maya fight. I mean, that was that was bad. I mean, what the what the hell was that? Um, Jennifer Maya went out there and was touching her up on the feet with ease. Jenna, uh, one thing about Jessica I man, she's super athletic. She's got good physical attributes. And I, I agree, she hasn't been healthy. And that was kind of the similar thing what happened in the Jennifer Maya fight. Jennifer Maya had been missing weight, just like I had been missing weight. Um, and now she's coming to she, Jessica I made weight this morning. She looks good. I honestly like what she says. I think we've seen in the past... Uh, We've seen in the past when JoJo gets into these beefs with Chu Kagan. I know you remember that face off, and then she complains that she got robbed. The Cynthia Calvillo fight back in the day, in which she complains that she got robbed. So it's a never ending thing. I feel like people, you know, I don't want to say she's got yes men, but I feel like jo Joanne Calderwood is actually low key the more mental fighter between the two. And I'm going to go with Jessica I here to actually. To, to win this fight pretty handedly. She actually went out there and beat you, Kagan. She, she made those necessary, necessary risks when she was healthy. If she's healthy, I think she should be the favorite, so I'll pick her. Yeah, she beat Vivi, too, so that's all I got to say. Co-main event of the evening, we got Dan Hangman Hooker. He's 20-9, and nine, and Iron Mike Chandler is 21-5. and five. Currently, they got Dan Hooker, minus 135, and Mike Chandler's plus 115. So, Shaq, I know we've had our words for Chandler in the past. I know you faded him against Patricio. Good job there. 
But I mean, for everyone saying that Chandler's not legit, guys, he's got a he he finished Eddie Alvarez back when Eddie was champ. Like Michael Chandler is legit. Regardless, I'm not saying he's gonna win a belt. I'm not saying he's gonna go on to do whatever. I'm not even gonna say I'm not even saying he's gonna get on a win streak. All I'm saying is that do not sit here and look me in the eye with a straight face and give me this B-League bullshit because this is not some bum from a B-League. He beat Eddie Alvarez. He beat Benson Henderson. He's beat UFC champs. I think he's the real deal. But that being said, Shaq, Michael Chandler is the perfect height for that big knee up the middle of Dan Hooker. But Dan Hooker is the perfect height for the D1 All-American wrestling credentials of uh, Mike Chandler. So who you got and do you agree with the line? This is a good fight. Chandler, I'm glad he finally came over. And yeah, you know, I have been anti-Chandler in the past, but I actually like what I've been hearing from him lately. He seems like he's in a good place as well. You know, that Patricio thing, I think he just got wrapped in it. Patricio got in his head. He, Patricio has a tendency to do that. I know you saw his comments about the Holloway fight. Him and Volkanovski had a, had a joke about it. They were like, uh, Holloway couldn't even finish him. <laughs> you know, so Patricio got in his head. I think he uh, was almost kind of broken going into that fight. So um, Chandler is big, powerful boy, hits hard. I know you remember what he did to P Patricio's brother, Patricky, back in the day. I mean, that was one of the most vicious stiffenings I've ever seen in my entire life. I was like, oh, my God. Uh, even the second rematch against Alvarez, uh, most people think Chandler won that fight. He had a bit, uh, bad stretch with the Will Brooks. The Will Brooks fights, things didn't go his way. And, you know, lately he kind of hasn't really been fighting the top competition. But maybe that's uh, kind of a good thing. You know, he's kind of coming into this matchup a little fresher than Hooker, in my opinion. Hooker's coming off a – it was a good fight. But I think there's a little bit of a misconception on the fight, too. I think the fight was a little wider. I might be biased, but – I thought towards the end of that fight, it was getting kind of ugly. I mean, Hooker's both eyes, his, both of his eyes were closed shut. And not to mention the fight before that, he's lucky he was fighting Paul Felder. You, you know, no offense to Paul, but Paul, Paul, you know, when it's, when it's, when it's, you know, close in the fifth round, Paul Felder ain't known, ain't known for uh, getting those split decision nods. You know, I know he got one against Edson, but for the most part, you know, that's Paul Felder's weakness. He, he he didn't do enough, and he didn't do enough in Australia that night. So, and let's not forget the James Vick fight, the, the knockout that Hooker got. I mean, Vick was on his way out as well. Ally Akinto was on his way out as well. I, I had a friend actually told me that he saw Ally Akinto in Chicago after the Cowboys Cerrone fight, and he talked to Ally Akinto personally, and Al and was saying he's not even sure if he's going to fight again. So, and then he fought Hooker, and, and we saw. So there's a chance that Hooker might be, uh, uh, you know, a little slightly overrated coming into the spot. And it's kind of similar to the Jessica I thing. I think it was cool when everyone uh, was – was uh, how many people are on Hooker in this spot is kind of – is a little sketchy to me a, a little bit. Um, I think Chandler does have a path to victory with a big right hand. He's got a – Watch out for that knee. He ducks down pretty much before every time he throws. But, you know, they, they got to be prepared for that. And the wrestling side, look, he is a big, strong wrestler, but I think it's going to be a lot tougher to wrestle, you know, Dan Hooker than it is going to be to wrestle, uh, you know, a washed-up Benson Henderson or a, a Brent Primus or uh Goiti Yamauchi, you know, Derek Campos and Gertz and, uh, you know, these guys that he's been fighting. You know, you know that classic Bellator lightweight roster. Uh, who else was in there? Gertz, Campos, uh, Patricky, Derek Anderson. You know those guys. Uh, so I, I think uh, I think it's, I actually think his better path to victory is actually a knockout, surprisingly. I think that he can touch Dan Hooker with that big right hand. Hooker drops his hands a lot after he throws. And Hooker, I hear he, Coach Eugene isn't out there with him. I heard he's just got some teammates out there, and I and I, and I don't like that. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if Hooker was just a class above, and this was just too much for Chandler. Chandler, at least along the last like four, three, four years, uh, besides Patricky, his competition has kind of been light. But I'm actually gonna go with Chandler, man. I, I just I feel like he's got a better mindset. I, I like Hooker's striking, offensive striking. I think he's one of the better offensive strikers in the UFC with the low kicks, the knees up the middle, his jabs 
all that good stuff. But one thing I don't like about Hooker is just his mindset and in his mouth. I, I think he talks a little bit too much. A funny guy. I like what he said about you know Charles uh, Olive and all that was funny and stuff. But a lot of times when things hit the fan, man, Hooker kind of just sells out and and starts getting beat up. I don't know. I don't know. I think Chandler might land that big overhand right on him or, you know, just be the aggressor, but we'll see. It's going to be close, but I'm going to go with Michael Chandler. I think it should be a pick him. I think he's got a little fresher, and sometimes we've seen, like, these guys coming from the new promotions, uh, they kind of get rejuvenated sometimes when they, you know, cross over. A lot of times you see these guys, we think, man, there's no way he's going to last in the UFC. Like, I remember when Justin Gaethje made his debut. I remember everyone and their mom was on Michael Johnson in that fight. They were like, oh, my, are you kidding me? Like, there's no way. Um, and Michael John uh, was coming off a hellacious ass whooping, if I'm not mistaken, um, before that fight. So I think uh, I'm going to go on Michael Chandler. So real quick, everybody watching this video, do us a favor. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. You help out the channel. So thank you very much. So tough fight. I agree with Shaq. It should be a pick em. So that being said, I got to go by default with the dog odds. But that big knee up the middle is a very big weapon for Hooker. And I won't be surprised if he catches him. But I got to go with the wrestling of uh, Chandler, man. Hooker's been taking a lot of damage lately. And Dustin Poirier, who I love, my favorite fighter, was out here, you know, taking him down at will, lacing up the leg. And Chandler's actually a D1 All-American, so I won't be surprised if he does the same thing. It's just, you know, Chandler's a little bit on the chinny side, and Hooker's a fantastic striker. Hooker's got the calf kicks, that big knee, like I mentioned, the length. So it's not going to be an easy fight by any means. It's just I think it should be a pick and Chandler's the dog. So I'm going to go with Chandler here. Don't get hit with that big knee, and there's a chance you might actually win. So I'm going to go with the former Bellator champion here, and you know then we can have discussions about fading him down the line as the competition gets tougher. Now, main event of the evening, we got the diamond, Dustin Poirier, he's 26-6, and six, and the notorious Conor McGregor is 22-4. and four. Currently, they got McGregor minus 300. The comeback on Poirier is plus 225. So normally, I see odds like that on Poirier – against anyone on the roster except Habib, and I bet him. But this is interesting because McGregor actually has a win over him, and I've only picked against Poirier twice in my life, Shaq. When he fought Connor the first time, and when he fought Habib. Aside from that, I've picked Poirier every single fight. Uh, but that said, man, the thing we love about Poirier is he'll eat your hardest shot and keep coming forward. It's just, you don't really want to eat these shots in the early going, but if this does hit the third, fourth, and fifth round, Momentum's got to switch to Poirier, and I really hope that happens because I'm rooting for Poirier. Not because I got anything against uh, Connor. I love Connor. Connor's the man. It's more so because like Connor's got fifty to hundred million in the bank. Connor's family's secure forever. Not that Poirier's isn't. Uh, Poirier's family is secure, but I, I want Poirier's grandchildren to be secure. I want their children to be secure. And you know what happens when you win against a guy like Connor McGregor? It elevates your career to that next level. So I'd love to see uh, Poirier win this fight. And uh, I'm rooting for him for sure. But I got to give a prediction, which I'll do in a sec. Uh, first, I'm going to let you go, man. I know this is a tough one for you, just like it is for me, because we love Poirier so much. We're rooting for him. Tough matchup. What do you think? Yeah, McGregor looked good the last time out, fought Cerrone, who was on his way out. But he still uh, treated him accordingly, 18 second. And he introduced the world to the uh, shoulder, <laughs> to the to the left shoulder with the with that fight and then the, the finish was just nasty yeah i mean this fight's kind of cut and dry to me i mean it's either look the moment is too big and mcgregor is gonna just walk him down and, and get him out of there but you know i feel like this uh the, this dustin poirier with this mindset i just don't see that happening I, I do see him getting to that second uh maybe even third round at least in the second i, I just see him being too composed in there he's been in so many wars since then i mean i'm talking high stakes wars i mean gunfights uh and, and yeah you don't want to necessarily get into a, a gunfight with here but i think they'll make the adjustment i think they'll you know stay stay a little clear a little more safer early be more professional and i mean it's, i feel like his chin man has been holding up very good i know none of those guys are the the hitters like uh like Connor is, but I mean, his chin's been put to the test and uh, it's been held up, at least in comparison to, to the past, you know, where people said he didn't have any chin. Um, and Gregor, we know what the deal is. He's either going to, he's a first, I don't want to say a first round KO guy, but he just comes out there, jumps on, jumps on guys right off the bat. 
and it's either you're too scared or you know you stand up to him. Um, and it's it's only two two t like real tough fights. We're at 170 against Diaz, where you know uh, Diaz took that damage. So in the late round, so I think he has a clear weakness in his cardio when the going gets tough. And you know I don't call Dustin Poirier the king of the king of wars for no reason. I mean, how many wars have we uh, uh, we seen? And he's the he's went out there and beaten you know guys that were I know Holloway might not necessarily be viewed as a, as a McGregor, but at the time, I mean, 13 fight win streak, uh, I mean, greatest featherweight of all time, uh, all this and that. And I mean, he went out there and got the job done 49, 46. So Dustin Poirier has went out there at big dog odds against, you know, world-class fighters before. Look, it, look, I wouldn't be shocked if he got knocked out. He, get, he gets hit every fight, but you know, I can't go against the diamond man. I, I think he's gonna, you know, survive this early storm, get to the late rounds, and and start putting up, putting it on McGregor, man. I think this is the bed has headspace he's been in a while, uh, and uh, I mean, worked his way back to the rematch six years later. McGregor's a, a beast, man, but it, I don't want to say it's surprising that this much confidence in him with just the the uh, small amount of ring time as of late, but. You know, I, I, I get it, man. The dude's a, a super dynamic striker that puts dudes out unconscious. So, um, obviously, wouldn't be shocked if that happened. But I'm going to go with this employee, man, to, to get this big one. Man, I hope you're right. <laughs> because could you imagine if Connor not only lost, but he got knocked out by Poirier? Because, like, every great striker in the UFC that's, you know, had their whole career and then retired, they've all gotten knocked out. No striker has gone through the whole UFC process without getting knocked out. And before someone says Izzy, Firstly, Izzy's career is not over. It's just beginning. And secondly, Izzy got knocked out in kickboxing. But I'm talking about guys that have actually, you know, been from the beginning to the end. They retired. I've never seen a striker not get knocked out, whether it's Anderson, whether it's Bisbing, whoever the case may be. So how amazing would it be if, if Dustin knocked him out? Um, but that being said, dude, I hope Dustin never sees this breakdown because it feels bad picking against him. I love the guy. I'm rooting for him. I hope he wins. But... If you're taking these shots early against guys like Hooker, don't get me wrong. Poirier's chin looks a lot better at 55 than it did at 45. It just, it's just tough with, with the kind of power that McGregor brings to the table, man. Um, if he can get past these early shots, then the momentum swings into Poirier's favor. But getting past that is going to be tough. So I'm going to have to go with McGregor here to get it done early, unfortunately. And not because I don't like Connor. I love Connor. It's just I want to see, like I said, I want to see Dustin secure his family's future. I want to see Dustin become a massive superstar. Um, and beating McGregor will do that for you. So I'm rooting for Dustin. And I like Connor too, but I'm going to have to root for Connor. I think he lands the big shots early, probably gets it done. Hope I'm wrong, but I'm going to go with McGregor here to, to finish the fight. And then uh, let's see what the great Habib Nurmagomedov. The undefeated champion. Let's see who he's most impressed with between the main event and the co-main event, and let's see who he fights next. Because um, I do think that Habib, he wants to complete, you know, father's plan. Rest in peace to the great Abdul Manap. Uh, shout out to him, the legend. I think that Khabib wants to retire 30 and 0. So he's gonna decide between the winner of Poirier McGregor and the winner of Chandler Hooker. Whoever had the most impressive fight gets gets to fight uh, the great Habib. So let's see what happens. Now, Shaq, we got to talk about the fight to watch and the fighter to watch. So, in your opinion, what is the fight to watch for UFC 257? Yeah, my fight to watch is actually going to be a surprising one. It's uh, this guy, Mahmoud Muradov versus Sanchez. I want to see if Mahmoud Muradov is really top 25, 20, if he really is this real deal, because Sanchez is the right gatekeeper. Sanchez has been in there with a lot of tough guys. He's been looking the best he ever has of recently. And when you got the money team behind you, I mean, you got to get into that top 15. Floyd ain't wasting his money for no reason. So uh, I want to see how this guy, Mahmoud uh, Murata, performs. Real quick, before I give my fight to watch, everybody watching right now, do us a favor. Hit the like and hit the subscribe. You help out the channel tremendously by doing that. We truly appreciate your support. For me, my fight to watch is the fight that got made today, Armin Sarukian versus Matt Frivola. Sarukian missed weight, Shaq, but he looked shredded out of his mind. Frivola's a gamer. It's going to be a very exciting fight. Let's see if Sarukian's the guy that everyone says he is. And Frivola, you don't just get, you don't just get past him without a fight unless you're taking uh, my boy Polo's Flintstone vitamins. So I cannot wait for Frivola versus Sarukian. That's my fight to watch. Now, Shaq, who is your fighter to watch uh, on Saturday night? My fighter to watch is going to be 
Amanda Rebus. You know, I think she's uh, up there amongst the top prospects in that in that division. And I think if she can get a win, but not just a win, if she can get a submission, I feel like they're gonna put her up in that top five up there with the Yan Chownans, up there with the Yoanas, the Sparzas, the uh the Nama Unises, all those. I think that if she wins this fight in, in impressive fashion, she's gonna turn into a big star. I, I know a lot of people are saying uh, her laugh is a little cringy. Hey, and, you know, it is a little cringy. But when you're out there dominating every second of every fight, I mean, you can't complain. So I think Amanda Rebas is the fighter to watch. Let's see if she, how she performs against Rodriguez, who we know is one of the top strikers in that division, fought a lot of tough girls. Um, and like I said, one of the top strikers. So let's see how Rebas deals with that. She has suffered a KO, a KO loss in the past, so we'll see. Me, my fighter to watch has got to be the former Bellator three-time world champion, Michael Chandler. I mean, this is a guy that we've people have said for a long time, what's going to happen when Chandler gets into the UFC? Well, Saturday night in Yas Island, Abu Dhabi, we're about to find out what happens when Chandler gets into the UFC. And he doesn't have a tune-up fight. He doesn't have an easy test. This is Dan Hooker, tallest man in the top 10, massive knees, big knockout artist, calf kicks. He presents all the things that have historically given Chandler fits. So for that reason, this is a serious test. Uh, Michael Chandler is my fighter to watch. Let's see if he can get it done at the UFC level. Well, Shaq, we did it. It's going down tomorrow in Abu Dhabi, UFC 257, McGregor vs. Poirier. They can follow you at MMA Genius 05. They can follow me at Best Fight Picks. Go to bestfightpicks.com for the plays. Subscribe to Half the Battle on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, all the places we are available. We truly appreciate all your support. Give this video a like and a subscribe. Thank you guys so much for everything. Um, and yeah, we're going to be back uh, for the next fight, I believe in two weeks, so we can't wait to do that. Also, I got some written work available at landmovement.com. Make sure you'll check them out. So thank you guys so much for your support. We truly appreciate it. And until the next time, let's cash these bets!